week, just baseball show. Uh, Monday night football tonight is what that's Russell Wilson's return to Seattle. So just baseball let's country, ride. let's ride. Just <laughs> baseball country, let's ride. Just baseball country, let's, let's ride. ride. Let's ride. Uh-oh. That's got to be one of the weirder things anyone's done. Well, so my favorite thing that happened with all that was um, the college football programs. Like you got all these quarterbacks of the college football programs or like the head coaches doing the same thing. Like JT Daniels at West Virginia. Oh. Mountaineer Nation, let's ride. <laughs> Mountaineer Nation. Like it was so So funny. cringy. It's so cringy, but everybody leaned into it, which was just awesome. Um, so we're, we're talking, uh, unions. We're going to spend 40 minutes talking unions. Does that yeah, make sense? Please, please. I'd love to just talk about that. Okay, perfect. So let's jump in. Um, union, yes or no? <laughs> y- yes, I, I guess. <laughs> I'm kidding. We're, we're going to talk about the rule changes. Obviously that's big. And, uh, I've seen them firsthand. You've seen a, a ton of them firsthand. Um, we are going to dabble in the union conversation, but not for long because we're not going to pretend like we know what we're talking about. Um, just mentioned on on another podcast that I hopped on that um, I've got an LSAT test prep booklet sitting in my uh, sitting in my TV stand right now, but I won't pretend that I've busted that out and taken a look at it. Like Why not a single that? page. Um, I, that's my fallback. Law school is my fallback. Oh, get get out of here, dude. That's I mean that's just is that like to make you feel a little bit like safer in this whole thing? Like, I think so. Yeah. To kind of just like hedge on the, I talk about sports and try to make a living off of it. Like, Oh, well, if push comes to shove, I'll just go to law school and just practice law because that sounds good. Well, Is full it- transparency. Um, I have crippling anxiety. <laughs> so I, I know. I talk, that's, so you just I, keep uh, that book around as like your, your basic, like, that yes. just quells yes, your like, anxiety. If everything goes to shit in this, even though I know that I am a rocket ship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stock is up. But if if you if everything goes poorly, you can just study for the LSAT, which you don't get paid for, and then pay or take out, you know, six figures in student loans yeah. to go to law school. Yeah, That's but- a much more settling fallback plan. Yes, but then you make bank, bro. You get paid. <laughs> yeah, <sick. laughs> Sick. I'd rather do this and not get paid. <laughs> I think I would rather do this too. And that's why we're still doing it. Um, but yeah, we're going to have a little bit of union conversation. Uh, and then another call up for a guy that has been so up and down, like maybe more up and down than anybody in minor league baseball so far this year. In regards to performance, right? Performance, it, which is interesting yeah. because we, we, we thought he should have been up in regards to promotion earlier. And, and it is fair. It's Mark Vientos and we'll get more into it in, in a little bit. Um, but you know, I'm excited. I think it's the right time to call them up. It's also works out really well. It, they're playing in – the Mets are playing in Miami. Uh, Mark Vientos grew up maybe 30 minutes away from there. He played in Broward County. Uh, I played against him even. I mean, it's he's going to have so many family friends out there in South Florida. So while I'm sure it was a longer wait than he uh, wanted and felt like he probably earned it a bit earlier – uh, at least he gets to make his debut uh, right right by his hometown. Yeah. Speaking of South Florida, what did you make of uh, six years with 133 guaranteed to Lamar Jackson? I love it. I love it. I love he it. He said no. I know. I know. I love it. Bet on yourself, baby. Oh, yeah, dude. 133. Pull the judge, pull the judge move. Bet on yourself. He, he, he deserves more than that. Um, and guess what? If he doesn't – if the, if the Ravens don't want to pay it, if they don't want to guarantee the amount of money that he wants – He's a dolphin, another another Broward County boy. I know Kodak's already recruiting him. I got no concerns. Um, yeah. So it, based on what I read about that, it, it, contractually, like the contract would be greater than Russell Wilson and Kyler Murray, but Lamar did not want a Russell Miller or a Russell Wilson or Kyler Murray type deal. Like he wanted a um with much better character, a Deshaun Watson type deal where he's got like 200 million guaranteed and he only got 130 guaranteed, but that's enough football contract talk right now. Uh, Rule changes. You in? Yes. Uh, We'll start with pitch clock. We'll kind of go step by step. So the big things that are implemented, obviously the shift, like two guys on either side of second base at all times, pitch clock, um, which, you know, I've seen disengagement rule, pickoff rule. And uh, is there another one that I'm missing? Bigger bases, uh, bigger. I don't. I, we, I don't give a, a shit, shit about that. Who gives I, a shit? Actually, though, I will say, can we start? Let's get bigger bases out of the way. I'm in. If it incrementally improves the like 
this guy came off the bag for half a second when we do slow-mo replay. So he's out like then I'm in yeah. because like, and I know there's still going to be moments where like the foot comes off the bag briefly or whatever it may be. But like, I am just very happy that there's a little bit more real estate for these guys to work with here because I cannot stand the like guy beats the throw. And I understand you have to enforce it this way. Like I'm not saying this, there's a, there's a better solution. He held the tag on his foot came off by half an inch and now, you know, he's out that, that stuff drove me crazy. Uh, so hopefully this kind of makes that a little bit easier for these guys to stay on the bag. Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and I saw it, it incentivizes stolen bases or something. I also saw that, um, you know, part of the argument was that it, it helps with uh, player safety. I'm all for the player safety thing. Like, and I absolutely understand why um, we see so many guys that, you know, will like extend a little bit too far on a dead sprint to first base and they pull up with a lame hamstring or they roll an ankle because at the very last moment they're trying to avoid the first baseman's foot who's holding the back. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm pro the player safety thing. I understand like the numbers speak to greater stolen base attempts and greater stolen base effectiveness with the bigger bases. I don't think it's going to have that much of a play. I, I don't think, think so. I think the other two things are going to have a really big play on stolen bases. And, and we'll start with the pitch clock. Yeah. So, I mean, it, yeah. I was say, you, you can speak to the pitch clock even better than I can, because, you know, I, I just, just from, from my perspective, whether I'm watching on M- MILB TV or um, I'm at the game, it's just so much more engaging, right? You are just, you know, there's less, intervals like just less time interval between action you know you're going to see pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch and it just keeps you locked in it's when there's so much dead time and an unpredictable amount of dead time you know like you look at football football has a similar amount of like if you look at proportionally the action that you get versus the time in between the action it's it's pretty similar in terms of sometimes how it can be slow. The difference is football, you know, the, the amount of time that you're going to have between plays roughly, of course, you get a timeout or a flag or this or that. But for the most part, you know, the time between plays with baseball, there's times where you just have a pitcher come in. He's just a human rain delay. Yes. Jerry's familia tying his shoe three times, stepping off three times. Like either there should be something in the back of these guys' heads, like, Hey, you, you got to have some urgency. Maybe for I'm the last being 100 a dick. years. Yeah. yeah, maybe I'm just slowing this whole thing down. You know, for the last 100 years, there's been nothing even like over the shoulder of these guys that's like, hey, maybe I should have one ounce of urgency here. So I, I'm all here for it. Yeah. So the the legitimate numbers around it, um, there will be 30 seconds between hitters allowed to the pitcher and the hitter. Um, 15 seconds between pitches with nobody on base with runners on base, the pitcher will have 20 seconds on the pitch clock. Hitters have to be ready to receive a pitch at the eight second mark. If hitters are not ready deemed by the home plate umpire, then it will be an automatic strike call at the eight second mark. If pitchers do not start their delivery by the time the timer runs out, that's an automatic ball call. Um, That is a second inflated from what we've seen in AAA so far this year. Um, We saw 14 seconds with nobody on, 19 seconds with runners on. Um, I don't know the big difference that a second will make. Um, I think that these guys could use a second to spare sometimes. Um, But overall, like this is massive for baseball. There is greater than a 20 minute difference in time a game at the AAA level this year compared to last year. And it, The pitch clock was in play last year. The difference between 2021 and 2024 in AAA was enforcement. Yeah, Home plate umpires were not enforcing it. Now they're enforcing it. And you will not see an automatic ball call that often. You won't see an automatic strike call that often. Um, I was trying to do the math. Like I've probably seen 100 automatic ball or strike calls this year in about 130 games to this point. So like it'll be less than one per game. Um, And you're just kind of an asshole if you accrue one, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, like 
and look, everybody has like their moments where y- y- you lose your track of time. You know, you- you're really focused on something else. It's a big spot, whatever. You had to step off. You're staring in a little long for the sign, whatever it could be. Once it happens to you once, it's probably not going to happen again. Yeah. You know, like that's the case for most guys. What I will say is I think there's going to be a little bit more of, of the growing pains for, for Major League Baseball. And I'm kind of bracing myself mentally for that. A, a little bit of the pushback in the early going where in a big at bat, you know, Nick Castellanos is like slow to get back in the box or like Josh Donaldson, like one of these veterans that have always kind of beat to their own drum and take their time with their routine. Like I could see that, you know, creating a bit of a conversation where we're like, are we sure about this? And they're going to throw a fit and whatever. Like I'm just mentally preparing for that. But overall, these guys are going to adjust to it. We've seen the adjustment period through the minor leagues. They, they came out with the numbers and I, I can try to dig it up of exactly how many times it happened, but it was a small, small fraction of enforcement and it went low. It, it dwindled as the year went on across all minor leagues. Uh, you know, w- when you consider the fact that it shortens the game, that's one thing. But I think the most important thing is kind of what we touched on in the beginning is, and I tweeted this, it, it's not really about the duration of the game for me. I know when I go to a sporting event, I'm signing up for three plus hours. I'm like preparing for that. What, what it really is for me is the engagement side of things, right? And, and I think that's the most important thing about baseball uh, that they needed to really improve upon is, you know, keeping fans engaged and and keeping the pace of play up. Pace of play is more important than duration of game. They co- they, they cross over. There's, there's an overlap there, but there's games where it could be, you know, high pace of play and it's 10 to 8 and there's a lot of offense and maybe it goes a little bit longer – but you don't feel like it was a five hour game because there's a good tempo to it. And, and I think that's exactly what we're going to get here with major league baseball. And I think it's going to be a really positive thing. I love that you ID Donaldson because Donaldson is absolutely going to be the guy to like throw a hissy fit about this. Guarantee it. I absolutely guarantee Josh Donaldson will be annoying about it. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, he, he, Here's the big thing. Like I want people to understand um, you're still going to be pissed by shitty games i i promise you you're still gonna be pissed by shitty games so like i i've used and i think i talked about it like when when the indianapolis indians were in charlotte taking on the white Sox triple a affiliate they played a game with 17 combined walks in two hours and 58 minutes um the game still sucked it was horrible um you know yeah you got out of there if it was a seven o'clock first pitch you got out of there before 10 o'clock but that game was so miserable when you were there. So the pitch clock will solve the pace of play issue. It's not going to solve the quality of play issue. No. If you draw the the bet, if you draw the the short straw, um, and you're at a shitty baseball game, it's still going to feel like a shitty baseball game. <laughs> Promise. Yeah, but it'll be a quicker one, and, and, quicker one. and that's the that's the great thing. I, I just pulled something up that's pretty funny before we move on to the next topic. Um, USA Today. Uh, their for the win site uh, put up a pretty funny article. Ten pitchers with the slowest tempos who could be most affected by MLB's. It says by the MLB's, which Ooh. Uh, that's not great. Uh, but by MLB's new pitch clock in 2023. Can I? Now, guess this them? is a great article idea, though. I, I love it. Yes, that's what I wanted you to do here. Okay. Obviously, it's going to be relievers uh, for the most part. I'm yeah. scrolling through. Um, but yeah, it's basically all relievers as I'm looking right now. Let's see what you what you've got here. Let's let's see if you can get how many of them you can get. So Hirokazu Sawamura is the yep. shittiest pace of play person ever. Is he number one? Uh, on well, list? actually, he's on here, but he's not the shittiest ever. He's actually the eighth shittiest ever. Wow! At about twenty two seconds between pitches when bases are empty, thirty seconds with runners on. That's the fourth slowest in Major League Baseball. But overall, they decided to give him the eighth spot between the two. That's incredible. I bet this list is very closer heavy because those dudes need to psych themselves up for every pitch. Correct. Uh, Kimbrel has to be on that list. Can you believe he's actually not? Kimbrel's not on that list? He is not. Dude. Um, Kenley Jansen has to be on that yep. list. Yep. He is well inside of it at number three. 25 seconds with the bases empty. 30.6 seconds with runners on like if you don't like the pitch clock right this guy's taking a half a minute between each <laughs> fucking pitch like this is the perfect and he's not he's not the worst keep going um 
more closers. I'm thinking like older side of closers. Uh, am, am I right in my thinking there? Yes, for the like, most part. So number one is actually a surprise. I'm going to tell you number one because you wouldn't get it. Giovanni Gallegos is number one. Gallegos um, is number one? 26 seconds with the bases empty. 33 seconds with runners on. I, I like, have no idea. Like that's yeah, because he's just so disgusting. He's right. probably just marvel for thirty seconds after he throws a pitch. But I mean, like that is a joke, a joke. Like you should not be taking that. I would get anxiety on the mound knowing that I'm making people wait that long. Around yeah, me. yes. Like I, 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 I would freak out. Um, Absolutely. Rolled as Chapman at number two. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. Jansen at three. Kyle Finnegan at four. You were never getting no. Uh, a familiar face for you at number five. Um, Bobby familiar Jenks. face. Sorry. <laughs> Bobby <What's> Jenks. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you're on the right track there. You're on the right track. Liam um, Hendricks. No. Oh. Uh, White Sox? Yeah. Current? Yeah. Joe Kelly? Yep. Joe yeah. Kelly. Fifth slowest with runners on 25 seconds or with, with bases empty, excuse me. 14th slowest with runners on. That's 28 seconds. It's, Devin Williams is also in there. Alex yeah. Colome. And yeah. then Emmanuel Class A, very surprising. I was not expecting him in there. Um, and then of course Hunter Strickland, who is going oh. to pitch a fit. He's gonna pitch a fit when he gets that automatic ball call. He's gonna freak out. Dude. He's gonna freak out and then get another automatic ball because he's gonna be tweaking out. Uh, after he got the automatic ball, and it's going to be a 2-0 count for the lucky hitter. So the three guys that I think are going to be the worst with this, um, Hunter Strickland, perfect. Josh Donaldson, yes. Madison Bumgarner is going to do it on purpose, like automatic oh, ball first pitch of the season just so purpose. we can, Just so we can throw a fit. Yes. Clean it just up. So can clean like, it up. Fuck this. <laughs> yeah, clean it up. Uh, and I want Muncy you. to tell him to get the ball out of the ocean again. <laughs> Still my favorite thing that anybody has ever said. Yeah, it's so good. Oh, man. Yeah, those guys are going to really need to adjust here. But I again, like 10 guys, you know, maybe maybe 20 Um, for the most part. like, And it's guys throwing like one inning every yes, two days. So yes. like spare me, figure it out. The um the real benefit to this, like I do think the pitchers can use this to their advantage. I think it's harder for hitters. Um, And I think that hitters are going to be the ones that are more vocal about it pitchers will use this to their advantage and we've talked about jared schuster before quick work oh yeah um when I and we talked to the guys who faced him and they're like it's annoying <laughs> yeah it's annoying um when a, a strike thrower is on the mound in triple a this year i have seen them cruise through outings in ways that like not many other guys have done. Peyton Battenfield had an incredible start that. for Columbus because he was a strike thrower. He was like 90% with his strike rate through like his first four or five innings. And he cruised. Like I'm talking like two and a half minute half innings because he was pitching to soft contact on the ground. Um, I do think that starting pitchers that pound the strike zone will have hitters on their heels constantly with this new pitch clock. And they'll have their infield on their toes, yes. which is the big part too. So that's the thing is you're working quick. Hitters feel like they just almost can't keep up with the way you're pounding the strike zone. We've talked about that because like Jared Schuster, he catches the ball. It, his heels are on the rubber. He's ready to go again. Former first round pick with the Braves, who's probably going to you know, be up at the big leagues next year. Uh, but the infield, it keeps you engaged as well. You know, there's nothing worse than slow, slow, slow. The infielders start to get on their heels. Guys, position players will tell you, especially from that lens, they love it from that perspective. They're, they'll admit, admit there was an adjusting period in the box, but then they got used to it. But in the field, you love the tempo there because it keeps you engaged and on your toes and, and feeling good. And um, I mean, it, that that's the side of it, too, that I think is going to allow for a little bit better defense and more engaged defense across the board. And it gets a little bit of the rhythm. Uh, of baseball back that we love like we fall in love with baseball because of the rhythm we fall in love because you can like once you understand that you know you can kind of like you know snap along to the beat of a three-hour baseball game it is such an enjoyable sport to watch because yeah, you absolutely. understand what's happening at each moment and that's why we love it like that's why you like watching the golden state warriors play basketball because it's rhythmic like you you don't really like you know when a guy strikes out 
the side, but has three walks sprinkled in there as well. And the bases are loaded and he gets out of a jam with another punch out. You don't like it. Yeah, I and like that comes, in the postseason. I, I'm good in the regular season. I don't need that every game. <laughs> no, it's just like, come on, dude. Yeah. But I promise you, I promise you, you will love the two and a half minute half innings where you're just rolling three ground balls and you're out of it. Um, We're going to get to the disengagement. We're going to get to the pickoff rule in a moment. But first, new ad read alert. Oh yeah. You ready? Do you have do you have the product at hand? I don't even have the ad read ready. I've got the ad read ready. Do you have the product? I do. Hold on. Go go get the product, Gimpy. Got wow, it. you got out of that chair so well. No more Post crutches. Switching. No more crutches. Um, I'm allowed to walk one block at a time, actually. Dude, you're crazy. Good for you. One block at a time. Hey, uh, we're going to tell you about diet smoke. Uh, diet smoke is the solution. There we go. There it is for our YouTube folk. Blue Raz, how about it? Diet smoke is the solution to avoid those, oh shit, I'm way too high moments. Diet smoke makes Delta 8 THC, Delta 9 THC, and CBD products that are perfectly balanced. They're gummies, drinks, vapes, not only delicious like your Blue Raz, they are guaranteed to give you that beautiful buzz you've been looking for without melting you into the couch. They extract their THC and CBD from American-grown hemp, meaning they can ship directly to your door. No prescription, no sketchy weed dealer, no need to even <laughs> leave the house. Diet Smoke just released a bunch of new products and flavors, so no matter what type of mood you're in, they have you covered. So if you're ready to get that perfect high, Head over to dietsmoke.com and use code just baseball, one word, all caps, just baseball for 15% off your entire purchase. Must be 21 or older to order. And most importantly for me, they're fat free. Oh, uh, that's good. I've been trending lately. That is good. That's awesome. Well, hey, now that you're uh, off the crutches, I'm sure those those block walks are really helping you. It's just falling off like, <laughs> like you're cutting yeah. butter with a hot knife. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm sure. That's how it works. I love it. Um, hey, we'll talk, we'll talk pickoffs now. Um, the new rule is you are allowed two disengagements with runners on in any plate appearance. Um, if a runner does advance a base, then that resets. You get two more disengagements. If you do disengage, if you do step off the mound for a third time and you are unsuccessful in your pickoff attempt, the runner is awarded the next base. This is the big one in terms of stolen bases. If yeah. a guy throws over twice, a lot of dudes will try swiping the bag on first movement. They've been wildly successful at the minor league level. Not only are we seeing stolen bases up, we are seeing stolen base percentage skyrocket. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I this was the one that I was a little bit, uh, it wasn't as much of a, I love this right out of the gate for me when I, when I first heard it implemented in the minor leagues. Um, and there were some other kind of rules within that when it came to holding guys on that they experimented with at the lower levels that I thought just kind of took it a bit too far. I mean, this is a, a good spot to kind of settle at, but if it, the, the fact that stolen bases have become so antiquated in today's game at the major league level, I, I'm here for any rule to bring that back. Cause I think those are electric and, you know, stolen bases are a really fun part of baseball. Yeah. My only concern is, and I know there's nothing worse than people picking off like four or five times in an at bat. Again, we we know that fans don't love that because they that's boo. one of the most easy. It's the easiest way to get booed ever. I think it's ridiculous to boo uh, because obviously these guys are just trying to keep the runner close. Uh, but I mean, fans boo because it's annoying um, and, and it really slows the game down. My thing is, you know, you pick over twice in a long AB, you know, let's say it's a seven pitch at bat. It's a battle and you pick over twice, you know, every three pitches there. Now the the base runner has such an advantage. It, it, it just almost is, is a little bit too dramatic of an advantage for me at that point, like being able to get a lead where, you know, there's a 90, 7% chance of guys not picking off, right? You can get an extra half step and uh, maybe a full step and dare him to pick off because if he doesn't get you, you just got the free base anyways. That part of it is a little bit weird to me. I'm going to have to get a bit acclimated to that. Um, but I again, I, I will prioritize the added stolen base to the game um, and, and, I'll, and I'll deal with it. But, but that is one thing for me 
that I'm a little bit on the fence about. It's just the kind of advantage you get after two throws over. I will say, though, three throws over and a single at bat is a lot. And it's at bat, right? It's not just when the runner's on. It's it's throws over per at bat. Is that correct? It's throws over per at bat. Yes. Okay. So um, that's better if, than like throws over per like period of time at per the guy on the base. Yeah. Yes. yeah that would drive me not. That would be stupid. Yeah, it would be stupid. But but I, they have it right. Um, You know, to the third, if you're unsuccessful, he gets the second base. Um, Efficiency is kind of the name of the game here. And I, I saw it last year at the high A level. I saw this pickoff rule. Um, the other rule that was kind of added to it was you need to fully disengage from the rubber. And I'm not sure if Major League Baseball included that or not, because that's big because you can't make that inside hop move as a right handed pitcher. Like you have to step off the back of the mount and throw to first. I'm not sure if that's included or not. That was the deal in high A last year. And I want to bring up a guy, Delvin Zinn. Who was in high A last yeah, year? Delvin I know Zinn. you know that name. Walked up to the Cupid Shuffle. I remember watching yes. him. Delvin Zinn had a 300 OBP in 67 games with South Bend. 300 OBP is like well, it's below average. Yeah, but he was 42 for 48 in stolen bases because he knew he had enough time with the full disengagement and throw over to get back with a massive lead. And as soon as he saw the slide step, or as soon as somebody threw over twice. He was often moving whenever he was on base, he was stealing a base successfully. And like, yes, he's fast, but not even the fastest guys in baseball should be 42 for 48, but that's what he was. Yeah. That that's where it's a little tough again. Like that's where it's like, but I, I will, I will err on the side of that because again, like look at the stolen base leaders this year in major league baseball. Like it's, it's just kind of a a joke. (laughs) You know, you're, you're seeing guys that, maybe aren't even full-time players, but are really fast, you know, among the leaders in stolen bases, which is, which is just kind of crazy to me. Like you, you actually have to go, if you're on like fan graphs, let's say, and you're pulling up stolen base leaders, you have to remove qualified because a lot of the leaders aren't even qualified hitters because they're not really like the full-time players. They're, they're running wild to try to add a value that you're not getting elsewhere. Major League Baseball's stolen base leader is John Birdie of the Miami Marlins, who's played 80 games this season. He has 32 bats. I will say that is a super high rate of stolen bases. If he played every single game, he's on pace for, you know, 60 bags, which is a lot. But, I mean, the fact that the next most is Cedric Mullins at 30, but he's played 135 games which is, you know, 55 more ball games than John Birdie. And I mean, it says a lot about how the art of the stolen base has become just, you know, removed from baseball. I mean, a guy with Trey Turner's speed should not only have 24 bags. A guy with Bobby Witt's speed should not only have 27 bags. Uh, and catchers are so good. Most starters have gotten so quick to the plate yeah. that I think this kind of evens the playing field out a little bit in that regard. Yeah, I think so too. And now I petition for the return of the Herb Washington type. And we brought up Herb Washington before. Herb Washington was a Charlie Finley stunt, former uh, owner of the Oakland A's. Um, Herb Washington, let's see, appeared in 92 plus 13, 105 games in 1974 and 1975. He was brutal, if I remember correctly. Like he, he, his efficiency on the base pass was not great. Yeah, he was, he was 31 for 48. So he was caught 17 times. He stole 31 bags. He didn't play baseball. He was a track runner, right? He was an Olympic track runner. 105 games, zero plate appearances, <laughs> 31 stolen bases, caught stealing 17 times. He was an Olympic track runner. So now I pitch Noah Lyles getting a major league contract. Fastest man in the world. Just said, I think the U.S. record for the 200-meter dash at 19.5-ish. Noah Lyles, if you're listening to this, if somebody knows Noah Lyles that can send him this, let's get you into major league baseball. You're you- going to have time to react with this pickoff rule. Yeah. Um, when somebody throws over twice to try and get you, just start just running. Just take off, man. <laughs> just start running. <laughs> All right. Tyreek Hill. I was thinking about Tyreek, just the way mm-hmm. he accelerates would be so funny as well. Mm-hmm. I want to see Tyreek do like a lap around the bases, just yeah. the way he would be able to, to cut the corners and everything. Uh, but no, I'm excited for, for more stolen bases. I'm excited to see how pitchers try to navigate this. There's definitely going to be a lot of strategy involved in this as well. Like You don't want to use that second pickoff 
unless you feel like you've got a pretty good shot because then you're giving yourself up a little bit, uh, you know, with that next pitch to, to give that base runner a bit of an edge. So I think we'll see one pickoff more frequently than we see, you know, two pickoffs uh, just for that reason alone. Uh, but that rule, you know, I don't think it's it's going to have as much of an impact one way or another, because how often are guys really thrown over three times in an at bat anyways? Um, you know, I think it's more of a minor adjustment, if anything. Yeah. Uh, two quick things. Shift talk, which I know neither of us really like to do. Uh, and then unions, which I know neither of us really like to do. Um, the new shift rule, two infielders on each side of second base with at least both feet in the infield dirt. Um Okay, good. Here's um, here's the caveat. I was thinking like if there was, um, and, and I brought up the example of Jeremy Pena and Jose Altuve, um, like Pena is a better defender than Altuve is. I was thinking, oh, you know, what if, um, what if you had Pena at short for right-handed hitters and flipped him to second for left-handed hitters? That is not allowed. <laughs> you designate two guys uh, to stand on either side of second base. Um I don't know. What do you make of it? It's tough. You know, I, I, this is one that I got more people, you know, more friends reaching out to me that maybe aren't big time baseball fans, casual baseball. Like, what are your thoughts on this? And like, shouldn't, shouldn't teams be able to defend in the best way possible any way they want. And for, for a long time, this is one that, you know, honestly, I'll be fully uh, an open book on this one. I still have not fully decided how I feel about it. Um, ultimately, I'm pro more offense and more balls in play. Uh, and and I think it's going to support more balls in play. You look at an Anthony Rizzo with the Yankees with the short porch and right. I think it's the perfect example. He he has no incentive to do anything other than pull the ball and lift. And yes. we knew, I, I said this going into the year. I was like, watch Anthony Rizzo is going to pull the ball and lift more than ever. And he did that. And, and it worked for him in the power department. But I mean, it's it just, it's turned him more into a three true outcome guy than he's ever been in his life. I, I, I look at that and I want to get away from that in certain regards. There's always going to be players like that because there's players like that. We had that back in the day as well with Adam Dunn and other pieces, yeah. other players out there. But for me, I want to see more, you know, backhanded plays and, you know, rangy plays. I don't want to see Manny Machado playing the ball off of the wall in right field. Like, I just don't want to see that. I want to see, you know, players ranging out and making impressive plays. And I, I think that's going to accommodate that. You also look at, you know, how hard it is to hit now um, with, with pitchers being able to you know, throw running two seamers or sinkers in on your hands. And people are like, oh, just hit the ball the other way. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to see okay. you try to, to fight 96 the other way in on your hands. Like, oh, it's that easy. Just hit it the other way. Like, it's not that easy. And these pitchers are able to, to make it as hard as possible on you. Like, that side of it, I definitely understand. And, and, and beyond that, I think the biggest thing for me is, like, We've seen games adjust through the years all the time as something you know gets exploited that just becomes that just kind of takes away from the enjoyment of the game. And I look at Shaq with the three second rule, and and I think that's got to be the best analogy here. Is right? It's like Shaq could just camp under the the freaking hoop all day long, and you're never getting in the paint. Yeah. And you know that's part of the reason why we ended up seeing the three second rule. Like I'm sure there was some pushback on that early on. Like, what do you mean I can't stand in a certain spot for a certain amount of yeah. time on the floor? Like, that's ridiculous. Dikembe Mutombo is in shambles. <laughs> yeah, like, like, come on. I, you know what? No one bats an eye at it anymore. It's like that's something that we just have accepted as a rule. So I look at Major League Baseball. I, I do see the 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 side, and I totally hear anybody that's like, you should be able to do whatever you want defensively. But I think it's gotten to the point where it's just so out of hand, um, and we have so much data and. And we're able to predict these these players, you know, tendencies to such a T that it's just it's just ridiculous at this point. And uh, we've seen batting average on balls in play go down so much year over year over year that who knows how far gone we would get if we didn't do this now. Yeah, I, I'm glad that we did it now. Um, I think we're going to see better defensive plays in the infield, which will be fun because we love slick fielding uh infielders like we do yep. i nico horner is gonna be amazing to watch i yeah. promise you he's gonna be amazing to watch so uh yeah i mean i'm i like i guess i'm in enough on this i don't have any strong thoughts on the shift just because i think 
the shift is one of the most tired topics in, in baseball. Um, real quick on the unions, and then we'll wrap with Vientos. The big thing is Major League Baseball said yes to minor league players joining um, the, pretty much the MLBPA. So the MLBPA, the Players Association, will serve as kind of the representative for mm-hmm. minor league baseball players. The gist is this. They have different collective bargaining agreements. So when the Major League CBA is up, that will have no effect on minor league salaries. That will have no effect on that. But there will be a minor league CBA where if they feel that, you know, the $400 a week for a low A guy is not acceptable, they can negotiate that at the next CBA. So this just allows them a chance to revisit how that's structured. And now, yeah. No, sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was going to say now the con is minor league players are now in a union. And while Major League Baseball needs Major League players, Minor League Baseball, the way you get to what you want to do, the way you accomplish your dream is by being on the field every day and putting in good results every day. And if Minor League Baseball gets ahead of itself and even floats the idea of a strike, I have no idea what Major League Baseball is going to do. Yeah, and That is the worst thing for Minor League Baseball ever. Yeah, I, I I thought about that, and I'm like, I, I, I don't know if, if we'll ever get there, um, because honestly, it, it's a valid fear, um, but minor league baseball and minor leaguers have been so neglected for so long that I think even having a seat at the table just allows them to to really be able to just improve on, on what they are. I, I guess the best way to put it is this. They've never really had a say in anything. Right. And, and and that has been very clear. And we talked about it during the lockout, like minor leaguers should have a seat at the table here. They should have a say in what's going on. And part of the problem of why we see minor leaguers underrepresented and, you know, underappreciated is because of the fact that major leaguers have so long not had really much incentive or much of a reason to go to bat for them you know, when during the the CBA negotiations they are too worried about themselves, which I get like they climbed through the minor leagues and dealt with it. And now they're trying to, you know, fight for themselves in, you know, what we just saw uh, during the last year, which was a nightmare. Right. So, you know, adding the minor leagues to it definitely could add a little bit of a wrinkle to it. But what I see here is just minor league baseball, having a voice, finally, these minor leaguers having a voice finally. And I think it's going to be more so for smaller things like, Hey, we want to see a 10% increase in salary or whatever it is. Like let's, let's have our voices heard on this. And I think major leagues, major league baseball will be more receptive to that. If there is a larger, more serious issue that, that really starts to, to, to bubble here, I, that could be a concern. But at the end of the day, these minor leaguers are trying to to make it. Um, they have too much, you know, at stake here. They can't afford to strike like major leaguers can, and, yeah. and I think that's the big difference. And just being able to have a voice now and a say and representation, uh, I think, is the most important thing. Um, and and just to be able to be heard, and, and that's huge for minor league baseball. And and I think it's a, it's a positive outcome. There's no really way around that. Hundred percent, and uh, the clock just struck one. That means that NFL Red Zone is live on Sunday. So I'll let uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll let Aram get out. But real quick, Vientos, um, terrible start to the season at the minor league level. Uh, hit a buck sixty four, the five sixty eight OPS in April, but then in May had a ten fifty OPS. I'm just going to give you OPS by month here. Vientos, five sixty eight, ten fifty in May, eight ninety in June, nine forty eight in July. 958 in August, 680 so far in September. So he had a bad April. He was having a fine September, granted only seven games, a small sample. What can Mets fans expect from Mark Vientos as they continue to make this division push? Yeah, so the the one negative will be probably some streakiness. I wouldn't say one negative. I'll start with like the somewhat drawbacks and why we haven't seen him yet. And then I'll, I'll definitely gush over him for a minute because he's been a guy that, that I've been high on for years now. And I'm, I'm a big fan of his, he's still extremely young second round pick, you know, back in, was it 2017? So, so it feels like he's been around forever, but he's still 22 years old. He was one of the youngest players in the draft when he was selected, you know, out of high school in South Florida. And this is a super talented hitter. When he was drafted, he was a shortstop. Um, he has gotten much larger, 
much more physical and much slower. He's six four two something. And you're not going to get great defense from him at third or corner outfield, but you are going to get supreme power. And, and I think some of the most effortless, effortless power you're going to see from a young, you know, player coming up right now, he can go foul pull to foul pull the way he backspins baseball so easily. Um, you know, he can hit it out of the catcher's mitt and go oppo, you know, off the foul pole in right field. And you're like, how did that get out? He's hit several where you think it's a fly ball, you know, routine fly ball that ends up carrying out of the yard. And this guy has ridiculous, ridiculous raw power that I think is he's going to continue to tap into. There's going to be some streakiness there. There's some swing and miss there. But his approach has gotten better and better as his minor league career has gone on. Uh, the power has continued to remain, you know, more consistent. Or if anything, he, he's tapped into it more and more, learned himself as a hitter. And he crushes lefties. He has crushes lefties as of late. And I think he's going to fill in that Darren Ruff role, hopefully, that Ruff was supposed to fill when they acquired him, uh, which is that DH crush lefties, uh, you know, just provide power. And that's something that the Mets need right now. And Vientos is going to be a good hitter for a long time. There's a reason why the Mets did not trade him at the deadline, given that they had some other pieces uh, that they, they knew they weren't moving, right? Beatty wasn't going. Alvarez wasn't going. We thought maybe Vientos could be the guy that goes. Yeah. They don't move him because of the power that he offers. I think he's going to be a really exciting bat for a long time. I don't know if he's going to make the jump right away and seamlessly transition, but I think there's enough reason to believe that he can, you know, tap into power right away. I just don't know how consistent it'll be out of the, you know, out of the gate. He's going to hit a big nuke for the Mets at some I know point in the next is. two years. I know he is. I know he is. Yeah. I Dude. think he's going to hit a big nuke maybe in this stint that he's up right now. I don't know how well he's going to do over the course of his duration of, of being up there this season, but I think he's going to have a big a big moment. And it might come in his hometown in Miami against the Marlins here. We shall see. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, I called it with Tyler Naquin. Like, I – I thought there was going to be one or two big moments that Tyler Naquin had in a Mets uniform and they would have turned from why the hell do we get Tyler Naquin to, Oh my God, Tyler Naquin's my favorite player. Um, I, I think we're going to run into that with, uh, with Vientos as well. I think he's going to hit a big nuke and it's going to be crazy. Um, happy belated NFL Sunday, happy NFL Monday. Um, let Russ cook. Let's ride. And um Aram and Peter will be with you tomorrow. Peter and I will be with you on Wednesday. Um, Again, any link you need in the episode description. Anything else? Um, I, I'm I'm gonna just date myself here, like predate myself, and this might be bad, but I want to put myself on the record. Yeah, Dolphins are beating the Patriots. Uh, Absolutely, I'm, I'm, I'm walking that in today. I think Joe Judge calling plays with Matt Patricia on a, what the hell is that? Dolphins win to a solid game. Um, I'm just just wanted to put myself on the record there. Dude, I'm in. I'm in. Mike McDaniel is a stud. So I'm it's also really funny. Mike. Really I like my funny. coaches to be funny. That's yeah. all I care about. Really funny. Um, I'm not gonna make any bear prediction. Um, so that's that. Hey, it's uh, gonna rain. I can tell you that. That's it's gonna all rain. I can tell you about David Montgomery. Let David cook. All right. Oh yeah. <laughs> See you guys.